Hey, what is up everyone, it's David here. In this video, I wanna talk about my short-term portfolio. I wanna show you what's inside, how it's been performing so far, and my thinking process behind the short-term portfolio. I also wanna mention that, no, I didn't forget about the how to boost your income video, or some extra tools for you guys to try out, hopefully very soon. So just make sure you subscribe to my channel and click onto the bell so that when I release those tools and also new videos, you can be notified. And one more thing before we get started. One of my main goals on this channel is to make investing as simple as possible, spending as little money on tools as possible. So if you have any feedback on what I can do better, just let me know in the comment section below. Or if you really like what I'm doing, consider supporting the channel via Patreon where you can try out my Discord server. As usual, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. But if you do learn something new, it would mean the world to me if you could gently smash the like button somewhere around here. And without further ado, let's go. So before I show you my short-term portfolio, there are a couple of things I wanna talk about first. Why do I have a short-term portfolio in the first place? And my framework of thinking in terms of how these companies actually end up on my short-term portfolio. And most importantly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the weakness on my framework of thinking because it's still a life experiment for myself. With this part of my portfolio, the holding period is going to be one to two years. And the main reason for even doing this is that sometimes in the market, I just don't see anything I like enough to hold on to the long term. My goal for this side of the portfolio is to create a consistent framework of thinking where I can generate a reasonable return within one to two years. Now you have to define what reasonable means to you. And for me, if the money supply is growing at 20% per year, then it will be my goal to try and match that. There are three main components to my framework of thinking. Well, firstly, is the current macro environment beneficial or punishing to the company I'm looking at? And secondly, is their fundamentals actually backing the company? And thirdly, does the technicals, basically the charts, do they line up for the company? I wanna quickly elaborate on the three criteria I just mentioned. When it comes to whether the macro environment is friendly to the company I'm looking at, one of the easiest way to tell is to look at the ratio TLT divided by JNK. TLT is long duration government bonds and JNK is essentially high yield, high risk junk bonds. And when this ratio is shooting upwards, this is essentially telling us that investors want safety. They want consistency. They don't want to take on risk. So this would be a risk off environment. But on the other hand, this period right here where people are taking on more risk by buying junk bonds, this will be an indication of a risk on environment. So during this period, high cash flow, reasonable valuation will do probably pretty well. But during this period, high growth cash flows in the future will probably do really well. And if we take a look at where we're currently at, you can see that investors are more looking for safety. So strong cash flow, really important. Reasonable valuation, really, really important. And then when it comes to fundamentals, I will go through this spreadsheet, make very conservative assumptions with a probability scenario and look at the expected return. Now, the higher the expected return, the more margin of safety that I have just in case I'm wrong. And it's more than likely I'm going to be wrong. And once I'm done with this, I will look at the balance sheet just to make sure they have a strong balance sheet and dig into the business model a little bit more. And finally, when it comes to technicals, I'm trying to understand where they're currently at with Elliott Wave Theory. Don't worry, I'm not even going to talk too much about technicals in this video. But beyond that, I will also try and understand whether they are in a overbought territory or oversold territory. And all of that will go into my decision making. In this short-term portfolio right here, I have two companies. It's NRW Holdings and also Redbubble. Now I've talked about NRW Holdings in the past in this video right here. So feel free to check out this video after this one. But going back to the sizing of those two positions, NRW Holdings is bigger. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. When it comes to the macro perspective, we know that in this environment, it's important to have strong cash flow and reasonably priced. So to tell whether NRW Holdings had strong cash flow in the beginning, we will go to ticker, go to estimates, and you can see that the free cash flow number for the 30th of June 2021 is 101 million. And then do 101 divided by 913 million, which is total enterprise value, you should get a free cash flow yield of approximately, say, 10%. So anything above a 6% that free cash flow yield is pretty good. And when it comes to industry prospects, one of the most important things to think about is that the EV revolution is here to stay. 
And a lot of the materials that goes into the batteries and EVs require to be extracted. So from an industry prospects perspective, I really don't think it's going to go backwards. I actually think that it's going to grow over time. So macro is a tick for me when it comes to NRW holdings. And the next step is fundamentals. This template, you have probably seen this way too many times, and this is public. I have left the link in the description box below if you want to play around yourself. And I've made some very conservative assumptions with a probability scenario right here. And the expected return, even after conservative assumptions, was really good. And there was enough incentive, basically, for me to keep digging. So the next step after the DCF model is go to financials and look at their balance sheet. And you can see that historically, their current assets well cover their current liabilities, which is a really, really good sign. They should have no problem in the short term dealing with any shocks. And then when we look at the debt to equity ratio, if you divide 267 divided by 485, you should get a 0.65 debt to equity ratio, which really means that for every $1 worth of equity, there is 65 cents worth of debt. And that's perfectly healthy. And on top of that, there is plenty of cash. So overall, when it comes to the balance sheet, there's nothing that I can really complain about. And the last step to this fundamental analysis is actually look at the business model and see if there's anything that will really hinder the company from generating more money, more cash flow in the future. So overall, the fundamentals for NRW Holdings is a tick for me. And then lastly, when I started looking at the charts, it was $1.50. And based on my own technical analysis, based on my own Elliott Wave theory analysis, it seems like a pretty good time. And the RSI uh, indicator at the time was somewhere around here. So it was definitely in the oversold territory since a massive correction. So I felt fairly comfortable adding a position at $1.50. And then very soon after, I actually corrected to $1.40, which means that the expected return looked even better. And I doubled down on this position. Overall, I started building this position at $1.53 and then doubled down on it at $1.40 towards middle of this year, right? And even though that this pan out really well in my favor and are outperforming the market, I need to be brutally honest. And I think that this is more to do with luck than skill because there were a couple announcements that was really positive for NRW Holdings and then it pushed it towards a new trajectory. So for my framework of thinking to be more consistent and more to do with skill than luck, I would need to be able to replicate the same results potentially with different companies over a longer period of time, just so that I know the framework of thinking is producing results that didn't happen by chance. The second company is Redbubble. Before I talk about whether this is a strong free cash flow company to fit the macro criteria, I want to briefly talk about the industry prospects for Redbubble. Effectively, this is a print on demand platform. So if you have a design, you can actually upload it onto Redbubble and then it can be made into stickers, pillows, t-shirts, clothing, wall art posters. So it's definitely another way to monetize your skill as a creator. So definitely riding on the creator tailwind. However, I do have some concerns about consumption moving forward into the future, whether people after the pandemic crash will continue to consume a lot of these customized goods. Not to mention that I think the print on demand platform business model is not as defensible because if a company like Shopify decides to get into the print on demand platform business, there is very little that Redbubble can actually do to defend their business model. But going back to whether Redbubble have a strong cash flow business, we go to estimates and then I'm looking for the 30th of June 2021 free cash flow, which is 58 million. Then go back to overview. And if you do 58 million divided by 935 total enterprise value, you should get approximately a 6% free cash flow yield. And that's pretty good. From a macro perspective, I have some questions around the future prospects of a print on demand platform business, but Redbubble is a strong cash flow business. So it's a tick on the macro criteria, but not as a big tick as NRW. And then when it comes to fundamentals, I have made some very reasonable and conservative growth assumptions. And there is incentive for me to keep doing research 
except the incentive isn't as big as NRW Holdings, which actually explains the reason why I have a bigger position in NRW Holdings, just because I am a lot more confident with my thesis. Just to build on the fundamental understanding a little bit more, we have to look at the balance sheet and you can see that the current assets will cover the current liabilities, which is really good to see. And they have very, very little debt with $129 million worth of cash. So plenty of cash to make a splash if that's what they want to do. So there isn't that much that I can really complain about with their balance sheet. And when it comes to the charts, by the time I was looking at Redbubble, they had a massive correction, a very, very substantial one. And I started looking at Redbubble on the 15th of June at around $3.50. So the RSI was heading back into that oversold territory. So based on my own fundamental understanding, technical analysis, and also macro understanding, I felt comfortable taking a small position at $3.50. Going back on my own transaction history, it was actually $3.45 when I took the first position, and it is currently outperforming the market at the moment. At the same time, I just want to say that this is more to do with luck than skill at this point. I personally believe that I was in the right place, right time, and I'll need to be able to replicate these results a little bit more frequently and over a longer period of time to actually determine that this this didn't happen by chance. For my CMC market portfolio side of things, it's currently worth 104,000 Australian dollars. The only change I did make is I have deposited a little bit more cash into this account. And other than that, I have made no other changes. And there was a few questions around, hey David, how come you have bought the Micron position in CMC and not in stake? Well, sometimes what happens is that I will have more cash in the CMC account, but not in the stake account, or I will have more cash in the stake account, but no cash in the CMC account. So I would just use whatever account that had cash at the time when I wanted to buy that position. And it just so happened that CMC had more cash. So that's why I bought the position in CMC. With my stake portfolio, taking into account the buying power, it's worth approximately 44,500, which is approximately 60,000 Australian dollars. And on this side, no changes as well. I'm really happy with my performance and also allocation so far. I don't have any complaints and there isn't anything that I want to change in the near term because whatever changes I did want to make, I made it earlier in the year. So I'm happy to just not do anything for the next couple of weeks besides maybe adding more cash or allocating this money. And as usual, I'm not sponsored by Stake, but if you do want to try Stake for yourself, I have left a link in the description box below. Thank you so much for hanging out with me all the way to the end. If you did learn something new, consider gently smacking the like button right there. Subscribe to my channel, click onto the bell so that when I release future videos, I can let you know. If you're still bored, I left a video on the screen that I think it's incredible to watch next. And as usual, Otto will always do the honors and I'm gonna see you very, very soon.